And I'll suggest that there's a large group of white Americans just like me in that respect. We have no blood relatives that ever practiced ethnic cleansing or slavery, yet so many seek to blame us for it. They seek to blame us for crimes our forefathers never even committed, and yet excuse and ignore other racial groups where crime is rampant today. Huh? But I digress. When we talk about Europeans stealing the Indians' land, I have to ask, which Indians are we talking about? White people aren't the only people who killed folks for their land. They didn't fight among each other tribes? Oh, um, uh, amongst each other, yes. Did they ever try to wipe out whole other tribes? I'm pretty sure they did. The American Indians did fight amongst themselves. Did they ever commit genocide amongst themselves? Absolutely. Yeah, there were warring nations and there were peaceful nations. It wasn't an equal playing field. Um, and what, what I mean by that is so when the Indians were conflicting with each other, when the tribes were conflicting with each other, they had similar ways of fighting each other, bows and arrows, spears, fighting, rocks, you know, whatever. And then white folks came across and they had different types of technology. Do I think that Indians killed each other for land before they arrived? I believe that, yes, that the different tribes fought back and forth. Um, but it's different, and I'm trying to explain how it's different. Here's the difference. Believers apply one set of standards to whites and another set of standards to everyone else. Isn't what the Caucasians did to the Indians the same things what the Indians did themselves? Yeah. Okay. They gave them a taste of their own medicine. Look, every racial group, ethnic group, just about any other group you can think of today has advocates. Every group that is except white people. Don't believe me? Go to any university today and count the classes and approved organizations dedicated to the advancement of specific races or ethnic groups. You'll find thousands, each dedicated to their own race, except, that is, any groups dedicated to white advocacy. There are none. And that's a major disconnect. I mean, let's break it down. Hispanics can be pro-Hispanic without being anti-anybody. Jews can be pro-Jewish without being anti-anybody. Blacks can be pro-black without being anti-anybody. But with whites, it's different. White people cannot be pro-white without being anti-everybody else. And that's a large disconnect. Can you see why I'm leery of the conventional wisdom on racism? The only positions made available to white people on the subject of our own race is indifference or supremacy. So are there consequences to all these disconnects? How would the fact that all races are allowed advocates except whites manifest itself over time? Do I think white people will become a minority? I, when I say that, I include particularly the Hispanic population. And yet I'm not, they're really, as I understand it, that's not really a race. Uh, so when we talk technically race, that's wrong. It's just that they are, uh, Hispanic people are a protected class. Do I think white nationalists have a point in saying enough is enough when whites are now at 66% when our founding fathers were at 100%? I guess I don't. I, I, I don't think they have a point. I don't appreciate those organizations. But to some extent, I guess I can uh, appreciate maybe their people's sense of loss. But in fact, white folks are starting to be a minority now. You think white people like that? Yeah, but see, like, see, like, it's more Mexicans than white folks out here. Just maybe someday it just means a completely blended group of people uh, that nobody will be able to figure out what anybody is anymore. Is that a good thing? Uh, I think that's a great thing. I think um, we are yellowing America and everybody's blending, and that, you know, I think that's a good thing. That's what it is. It's so many different races and, uh, races and so many different backgrounds. And it, it's a good thing, you know, something that people should accept. It's, it's not like everybody's from England or everybody's from Germany or everybody's from France. This is a melting pot. 
it's 2008 now, you know, it's time for change. America isn't just, you know, the stereotypical um, Caucasian family or this and that. It's, it's, it's what, a, a mixing bowl? So let me see if I understand the position of those here illegally from Mexico. Although most belong to no one race, many unite under the banner of La Raza, or The Race, in order to accuse Americans of racism. That just doesn't make any sense at all. In other words, if we object to the stated agenda of replacing whites as the racial majority in America with Hispanics, it's us who get called the racists not the people who are openly and actively working to change the racial makeup of our country. Does the word racist still seem like a good word choice? Or does it appear more like a tool of oppression? Why do you think there's so many Hispanics in fast food right now? Tell me. Well, I think it's because they're, a lot of them are illegal. How do you feel about immigration from Mexico? I think if they gonna come out here and live, they gotta abide by the laws. If they ain't gonna abide by the laws, they might as well get out of the country. Ooh, that's a good question. I think we got enough here. And just imagine how what America gonna be 15 years from now. Oh, I can see the potential for a lot of racial tension between blacks and Latinas. We're you're here bleeding our our you know our social services. You're using our hospitals. You're using this without contributing anything to our society. They can come over here and don't even have to speak English. You know what I'm saying? If we were in their country, we would have to adapt. The people who want to come to America, the people who want to come to America from Mexico, uh, my feeling is, by God, let them in. You know? Uh, absolutely. We've got some people saying that we've got to open up the door and allow more in. And no, we've got other we shouldn't. saying that we should close the door and build a wall. Close the door and build a wall. And what's so bad about it, these Mexicans have more of an attitude, they, they look, they're more arrogant than, than what a white man is. So you say that the Mexicans are more racist than the whites? Yes, yes, especially the ones with the big belt buckles and the reptile shoes. You know, the United States lets 250,000 immigrants come in every year. It's more than any country in the world. Correct. But you think that's not enough? We're not being generous enough? <laughs> well, I think we got too many already. We got too many? Too many. If you were the immigration Czar, oh. what would you do if you if you could give one order? What would it be? I would send them back. All 20 million. Yeah. It comes down to uh, our rights as a as a U.S. citizen. A citizen. Uh, a citizen. You're not a citizen, right? No, I'm not. Okay. If you were the president, what would you do with the 20 million illegal aliens that are here? Oh, single dose adios. They they they'd be gone. Oh, it, it would be no problem. Oh, uh, yo, yeah, they, they'd be gone. Oh, oh, no. Now, if I said that, I know what would happen. I'd get called a racist. So where do the believers come from? Why do so many intelligent people overlook all these disconnects on matters of race? I think I know the answer, because I used to be one. Like many others, I was trained to be a believer. I remember it well the day I got my training on the subject of racism. I was in the fifth grade at one of many Jefferson Elementary schools in the Midwest. Our teachers were Mr. Lee and Mr. Dragland. One day they announced to the class that we were going to play a game. It was called a word association game. The teacher would write a word on the board and we were all supposed to shout out what that word made us think of. It was going to be fun. Mr. Lee began, and he wrote on the board the first word in the game. The word was white, and he pronounced it white. And we responded with words like clean and pure and honest. And as Mr. Lee was noting them on the board, we added more. Words like good and fair and bright. And then it was time for Mr. Dragland to choose the next word in the game. He wrote down the word black, but he pronounced it black. Almost angrily, he said, black. And we responded with words like scary, dark, and evil. He wrote down our answers as we tried to think of others. Words like empty, or mean, or dirty. And then we all got the surprise of our young lives. Our teachers were looking at the board, but then they turned to us, and Mr. Lee announced, 
You're all racist. We were stunned. When one of the kids challenged them, he said, I'm not a racist. I remember Mr. Lee saying something pretty close to, these are you kids' words, not ours. And frankly, we're both disgusted with all of you. The game had obviously ended. The classroom was silent, except for a couple of kids quietly crying. And for the rest of the day, and for the first time ever, we all got the silent treatment from Mr. Lee and Mr. Dragland. They were disgusted with our racism, and I never felt more ashamed of myself. And from that moment, I swore that I would change. From that day forward, I would believe that I am, by nature, a racist. So I ask you now, what is real? I mean, if racism were a real issue, then why do public school teachers have to trick children into believing in it? It makes you wonder, what is real? Do you see race as anything other than the color of someone's skin? Um, I personally, I personally see race as the color of someone's skin. The idea of race is strictly a, uh, a social construct. Oh, it's just, it's, it's just a distasteful subject altogether to be making judgments or even observations about humans regarding their, their flesh tone or their, or their body shape. Scientists have came through and proved that we are all the same. So are you suggesting then that race is more of a social construct? Oh, absolutely. So here's some more of that conventional wisdom regarding matters of race. The fact that the different races share between 90 to 98 percent of their DNA is accepted as proof that the races themselves are not real, but rather a social construct. Now it's very rude to point out the disconnect in that logic, mainly that the sexes, men and women, actually share more common DNA than is shared between the races. Yet no reasonable authorities are labeling the sexes as a social construct. In fact, the best example of a social construct I can think of is... We gotta work too. Well, I mean, isn't affirmative action was no, it it's not blacks? working. Yeah, it was affirmative action, but it ain't, it's not working the w way that it's supposed to work. They, they hire a black female and say, yeah, we hired a, a minority and we hired a female. We got a double Kill two birds minority. with one stone. Yeah, okay. and, and, the, and the black men are left out in the cold. I was born female and um, have been living somewhat as a male for about 10 years. You mentioned you had a, a teenage 14-year-old daughter. Son. Son, I'm sorry, I'm confused. Yeah. Biological? Yes. So I gave birth to him before I transitioned. For example, a city like New Orleans or Chicago, some people will call them black cities. Mm -hmm. uh, they overwhelmingly vote for black politicians. Yeah. Is that evidence of their racism? I think they just want to see their own race come up. You said you see racism every day. Can you give me another example? Another example? Oh, I've been, because I'm, you know, I've been, I'm, oh man. I just, but really not, I really don't see it that much in this town.